Well, Cecil, we're glad to have you back from uh, my home state, the uh, Sunshine State. Um, Alabama with a, a little bit of a, a mixed bag, I guess you could say down there. The football team uh, taking care of business against Michigan in the Citrus Bowl at Camping World Stadium on New Year's Day. Uh, a few days later, the Alabama men's basketball team looked like it was well on its way to taking care of business against the Florida Gators. Unfortunately, it saw that 21-point lead there late in the first half sort of evaporate credit Florida to sort of waking up and, uh, yeah. and more importantly, hitting some shots and uh, perhaps, I guess, not fouling as much as Alabama did in the game. But uh, just talk about – Certainly, certainly managed take to, to stop the fouling there for the last 10 minutes of regulation. Kerry Blackshear so did a great job of not fouling, right, with four fouls. <laughs> I think I think when he got the technical, I think Mike White was explaining that his guys weren't really fouling that much. <laughs> I think he got his point across. Yeah, getting points across will be key for Nate Oates once again as his team tries to rebound here. Uh, and, and literally, I guess we need to talk about rebounding and post play because tonight with Mississippi State coming to Coleman Coliseum with Reggie Perry and some of that size and ability in the in the post, uh, I guess that puts even more of an emphasis on Alabama to be good from the outside as it has been of late. Yeah, what what Alabama's doing is what um, the football version of what the the running shoot teams or the Big Twelve teams of, of a few years ago would try and do, which is just put an offensive number up there and see if you could catch it, you know, and and see if you could get um, eighty or eighty four. And you know, a lot of teams can't do that. Florida managed to do it there at the end and catch up, but. Um, that's that's the way that Alabama is going to choose to win. Sometimes, you know, you're going to give up more points than you like. But if you're going to pr- keep that tempo and play that tempo all the way, you know, it, it's almost like. Um, and this is the first year. You know, Nate, Nate Oates, let's understand Nate Oates doesn't have the roster exactly the way he wants it, and so forth. Uh, but it's like Mike Leach football. You know, and and that's not to say they didn't play some good defense. They had a really good defense at Texas Tech. The year that Alabama played them in the Cotton Bowl, but um, you know, you do what you do, and you you can't if you're committed to it. You don't shift gears after three quarters and say, "Well, we've got a lead. We're going to stop doing what we do and you know try and milk the clock." You can do a little bit of that, but if you're committed to what you do, that's what you do. Um, the day's going to come. One of these games, the threes are going to keep falling, and Alabama's going to beat somebody by twenty-five or thirty. So when you look at this team right now, and really the league in general, you've got Florida after its road win last night at South Carolina at 2-0 in the league. Kentucky goes into Athens last night, gets a win over Anthony Edwards and the Georgia Bulldogs to move to 2-0. and Auburn looking to do the same tonight at home against Vanderbilt. Arkansas in an intriguing matchup tonight as well, making the yeah, trip to, to Baton Rouge. Um you know, you look at both these teams tonight, Alabama and Mississippi State, especially with what they've got coming up on the road Saturday. You know, we've talked about it before. There, there's not really, I guess, a, a true must-win scenario for teams in, in early January and this early in conference play, but tonight's pretty damn important to both these teams. Sure. Oh, yeah, and particularly Alabama because they're playing at home. Um, and, and Kentucky and Auburn are their next two games. They'll have you know, through the through the first four games and again with Arkansas and LSU would be in the conversation too, but but you could argue that of their first four games, Alabama will have played the three best teams in the conference in Kentucky, Florida, and Auburn. So um, the one that's not quite at that level, although State's very talented, but you, you're playing that one at home. You know that's the one that you you kind of got to have. In terms of in-game situations and how this team is still trying to figure things out, Cecil, uh, Nate Oates it, it says the right things after games like Penn State and Florida uh, in which Alabama wasn't able to close those games out. You know, How much of it truly, though, is 
a, a mindset or a culture that you're trying to change if you're Nate Oates? Or how much of it has it been that perhaps Nate Oates himself in those situations could do a little better job? Well, I think it's a combination. Um, but, I, but I think that ultimately players win games. You know, if, if you're going to criticize Nate Oates and say, oh, they didn't get the ball in. Well, actually, they did get the ball in and had to get the ball in again at the end of the Florida game. And that's not a situation that you want. You've, you've made a more difficult situation. When Kyra calls the timeout and you've got an inbounds from the side, you can't move side to side, you know, you're, you're planted. He's called the last time out. You can't call timeout and get out of it. Um, better, you know, better than the timeout would have been for Kyra to just jump up in there and throw it all the way to the other end. I hope one of his guys ran it down. But even if they didn't, it goes out on the far baseline, at least Florida's got to attack a set defense into right. just shoot the layup. But that that's gotta come. I think that, that um it's the it's the age old adage about Alabama football that they expect to win, so a lot of times when they get in those situations, they do the things that it's necessary to do to win. And I, I don't know that Alabama basketball is in an expect to win mindset just yet. It, it'll just have to It'll just have to come. You know, they've had that situation in three games, Penn, Penn State, Florida. Um, and it's just going to have to It's just gonna have to be a case of having it happen, I think, first of all. You're going to have to hang on in one of those games or, or hit a buzzer beater and see the ball go through the hoop or, or see the big stop at the end. And uh, as you do that, then your confidence will grow and you'll, you'll do more of it. So uh, I think that's. That's an important part of it. Now, the SEC road is going to be tough. It's going to be tough for everybody. I know there was some, some road wins last night. Um, Kentucky, which I, I thought showed a lot of toughness against Georgia. Um, Florida went up to South Carolina. Um, so, and 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 there are teams. That I thought I thought those were the marquee games. I thought watching Texas A&M, Ole Miss. Tennessee, Missouri, those teams aren't better than Alabama right now. I mean, they're, they're, they may win. It might be a toss-up. But those are games that Alabama, you know, at that level of the conference, Alabama should be pretty competitive. Yeah, we talked about it a little bit at the start of the segment. You, you've got Florida. You've got Auburn. You've got Kentucky. Uh, pretty much at the top of that list right now, but I agree. I think uh, what four through fourteen, you, you could see a lot of different things on just about any given night in the Southeastern Conference right now. Big week, obviously, around here in terms of the Tua Tonga Vailoa announcement. Cecil, uh, I know you were there on Monday for that news conference, uh, and. You know, we get caught up in the numbers so much when a guy goes on a run like Tua did, especially after the the last two seasons in which he threw 76 touchdown passes and just 24 starts uh, since the start of the 2018 season. But there was more to it with Tua, wasn't there? I mean, the spirit that we heard Nick Saban talk about, um, just how he impacted uh, the University of Alabama community in general and, and even beyond, I guess. Well, I think people have to understand in context that for all the winning and all the championships, there had not been a and, – and for all the good quarterbacks, you know, I, I think I think some guys get overlooked. A.J. is a very good quarterback. Mm-hmm. You can say what you want to about A.J., but I thought he was a very good college quarterback. Um, Walter Lewis, Richard Todd, whatever, but – Really, since Namath, and, and there there are few, very few people around who really remember Namath, and and it wasn't an, even though he was certainly well known in college as the best quarterback and made the sensation in the NFL, but you didn't see Namath on TV every week, and and he didn't play in front of millions of every week. So, two is a unique um, individual in the context of the Alabama program. Uh, that he also threw the second and 26 national championship winning pass uh, just added to that. And then there was just the personality. You know, people just liked him. They liked to see him 
playing the ukulele. They like to see him be interviewed because he's so open and honest about things. Uh, so it was a combination of all those things. And I think the one, the one unfair thing, and you, you, I guarantee, somewhere on the radio or, or you know, in your many in your many travels, uh, you've heard people talk about who the next to it is going to be. There's not going to be a next to it. There may be a great quarterback, but don't don't saddle anybody with the expectation that they've got to be to it. Speaking of the next quarterback at Alabama, and we both know what that means when there's a open competition for the job around here, um, just sort of looking ahead to March and April, what's your expectation in terms of the the attention and the focus that will be on Bryce Young and Mac Jones and Talia Tonga Vailoa, because you're still going to have uh, a Tonga Vailoa in that mix. Paul Tyson and his connection, as we know, <laughs> to right. the program. Um, considering all those factors, how does this one project maybe in relation to so many of the others that you've seen around here? Well, I think that, I think that Mac, first of all, I thought Mac played well in Orlando. And there's absolutely no reason to think that Mac won't go into the spring as the number one guy. And then we'll see what happens from there. Yeah. Um, Bryce Young could not have had a better high school career. Absolutely national player of the year in high school as far as everything I saw. Now, different positions are evaluated different ways. But quarterback's always going to be the main guy. And I thought Bryce Young was the best one. So how that will translate over into, into college, we'll have to wait and see. He's got to get stronger. You know, he's got to get bigger and stronger. Um, and that will happen for him at some point. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see. It'll be a fascinating A-day as everybody wedges in among the construction crane uh, <laughs> to, sort of see how that, to sort of see how that plays out. But, you know, Mac is Mac's a, Mac's a heck of a, a commodity is, you want to put it that way. I mean, I'm not trying to depersonalize the situation, but you know, he's a he's a graduate with two to play. Mm -hmm. um, so he's either going to have the job here, or he's going to have some some really attractive options available to him if that's what he chooses to do. He may love Alabama, not want to go anywhere. I'm not speaking for Matt, um, but you know, the the thing about it is, you you you'll have a Winner, somebody will be the quarterback. Nick Saban may not announce it. There, there may not be any more definitive statement on a day or you know, the end of April. Then there will be a, a week before they play Southern Cal. He's played it that way before, uh, but but that, and off season is part of that part of that process. But you hadn't, if it were ten years ago, uh, the transfer options weren't open the way that they are now and that enters into it a little bit too not saying it, that it, it, it's hard to keep four or five guys happy well, in a quarterback room that's why you're signing level. signing two in a class more than you ever really did in the past or in the in the recent past anyway uh with the 85 limit you're you're having to do more of that to keep that number in that room where you need it to be. And this isn't to say that Mac Jones could end up being a Joe Burrow like guy in 2019 that we've seen, but you're right. He's got two to play and Cecil, he's got more tape than Joe Burrow had when he left mm -hmm. Ohio state. Right. I mean, he, he, commodity, I think is a great word for it. He does. And, and, you know, and, and it's, and it's, Good tape. Again, people say, oh, he threw those two pick sixes against Tarver. You know, he, he just watched the Michigan tape. I mean, he made some yeah. throws. He, he did some things. And he managed, you know, God forbid anybody's ever called a game manager again, but he managed the game. So, yeah, there's, again, at the, at the very highest level, you know, at this playoff four level, you've got to have a guy these days. But man, there's there's a lot of programs that would take Mac Jones right now, and no questions asked. It sounds crazy, crazy Cecil, because we all know what a healthy Dylan Moses means for that defense. But 
Could it be said that in terms of importance to that 2020 team that Alex Leatherwood coming back is right up there with Moses and maybe just as important or more than than Leatherwood is Devontae Smith coming back to go along with Jalen Waddle, so you can maintain that dynamic through a quarterback transition of having multiple big time elite playmakers that opposing defenses have to deal with. It, 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 do you, I guess the, the question is, did, did Alabama come out of this thing up till now pending Najee Harris's a decision right. that we don't know for sure at this point? How has Alabama come out of all this, in your opinion? I think they've come out really well. They, they would like to have had Xavier McKinney come back. I always, I always thought the logical thing for Tua was to take the money. You know, mm-hmm. that, that doesn't mean that that he didn't have other factors in his mind, but I always thought that was going to be the logical outcome. Um, would have been great if Xavier McKinney had come back, that I understand where he was, same with Henry Rugg. But all of a sudden, it's not a, you know, if, if Dylan and Josh McMillan come back healthy, mm-hmm. I mean, look at the, from going, from having no experience at those linebacker spots. Look at the experience you'll have next year. To say nothing of the physical talent. Plus, they've got they've got two really good linebackers coming in, in state kids, um, in Kennedy and Robinson. So that position gone from a question mark to an asset. Offensive line so dependent on chemistry. All of a sudden, you may only have one fairly small shift that you have to make to have a really elite offensive line yep. with the way that Deontay Brown's been playing uh, with Dickerson, with Leatherwood, with Evan Neal. Maybe Dalcourt comes in and plays some center. You know, yeah. That's, that's, you know, you're, you're starting from a good, pretty good point from 2020, and then the receivers, you know, all of a sudden now if you've got Waddle and Devontae, and I think Mechie's going to be really good. Uh, you've got a core there, and that's without getting into your freshman and, and your incoming guy. Uh, so it's there, there's a lot of stuff that's in play. There are a lot of a lot of things that that could be. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Nobody knew what the injury situation was going to be for 2019 in January of 2019. But you, you've got to think that, that Nick Saban likes a lot of the pieces that he has. From a coaching staff perspective, a lot of smoke with Steve Sarkeesian here in the last couple of days, the Alabama offensive coordinator in connection with the vacancy at the head coaching level at Mississippi State. Um I guess this is one of those things. We talk so much about the defensive side of the ball for three or four months uh, because of its its struggles. And and, uh, a good bit of that uh, was was justified in terms of uh, the injuries and the the inexperience at so many positions on that side of the ball. But here comes one of those things that you don't talk about. And it kind of crops up with Sark and potentially – Mississippi State is, is this coaching staff moving forward. Cecil, would would you even venture to guess what this group might look like in a month's time? No, because I don't know what John Cohen's going to do at Mississippi State. I think their first two choices were Billy Napier and Joe Judge, um, and doesn't look like they're going to get either one of those guys. Clearly, Joe Judge is about to take the Giants' job, and I think Billy is, has giving him a pretty definitive no after them making several runs at him. Um, so so I would think Sark would be in the group of candidates that they're considering. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, the, it's the Tennessee search from two years ago um, in reverse because it's the offensive coordinator instead of defensive coordinator, but it's, well, we missed our guy. We missed our second guy. Let's go get one of Saban's coordinators. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the default um, down the stretch. Yeah, yeah, the default situation. The state probably, I, I can't speak for John Cohen, but they probably wish they hadn't passed on Jeremy the last time. So yeah, we'll see how it all works out. But state's a tough job. But um, you know, like like everybody now, it doesn't matter if you're one of the 
top two or three programs in the SEC or, or you know, one of the others, you got plenty of money, you can pay a guy. So, so if that were to happen, I would, I would think it starts on a list probably with a couple of other guys at the state. And if that were to happen, would he take a couple of Alabama guys with him? He might. Uh, that's, that's all possible. So it's, the, the, merry ground, the merry-go-round has to stop going around before you know which horse you're sitting on. That's maybe, the, maybe Cecil, this is what that Domino's tweet was in regards to by the, Could be. the Could Alabama be. football department uh, a little while back. I'm this not, is I'm not touching Domino's. that one. Dude just, dude just needs to say, <laughs> man, it was lunch, I wanted pizza, and that's, that's, leave it there. There you go. Cecil, as we let you go here on a Wednesday edition of Southern Fried Sports presented by Peter Rook Chocolates here, let me get your Clemson LSU pick. Uh, we'll talk after the game, I'm, I'm thinking. But uh, Monday night in New Orleans, who do you like to win the game? I think LSU is going to finish it off. I think they are. They're, they're, they're tough to stop. Um, and, and Clemson's been great. Clemson's got some great players. Um, LSU is just stacked with dudes. I mean, they are yeah. just stacked with them. And Divinity coming back, and Delpit being more healthy. I mean, Edwards we'll see how they play, more but they have got they have got super athletes running around out there. And I think with if, if unless Joe Burrow does something he hadn't done all year, and kind of goes haywire, um, I, I just don't. I, I just think LSU. I'll put it this way. Clemson will have to play better against LSU than they played against Ohio State, and I don't know if they can play better. Yeah, that, that's where I, I, I run into the, the wall of, of being able to sort of get on the other side of of thinking that uh, Clemson can get the job done. They don't – Clemson, in my opinion, they need a couple more Isaiah Simmons types in that in that back seven on defense to deal with all those weapons that uh, you just outlined for us there between the three wide receivers, between Thaddeus Moss at tight end, uh, Edwards LR, uh, more healthy with that hamstring, you would think, at running back. I mean, uh, I agree. I, I think LSU just uh, a little too much on the offensive side of the ball. Well, Cecil, as always, we appreciate the time. Enjoy the game tonight over there at Coleman Coliseum, and we'll check in with you again real soon. Okay, Travis. Talk to you next week.